Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul series in Kerbal Space Program 1.0.4. In this episode, as you can see, I'm going to try and retest a uh, lunar flyby mission. And so I've made the upgrade that many people have suggested, which is to put another heat shield at the bottom. Let me get that off there. So uh, instead of just having the pod's own heat shield, so, oh, didn't get the decoupler there. All right, so there is the heat shield, the new heat shield. And so it's just a uh, two meter heat shield, 200 ablator, and I've removed the ablator from the pod itself. So 200 ablator gone. This heat shield, if we take a look at the aerodynamics claims, that is, it is a lunar rated heat shield. So, okay, well, we'll go with that. Now, then we have the decoupler and then the service module. I've made one other change because we unlocked uh, cryogenic stuff. I was able to add a fuel cell. Uh, if I can. Unfortunately, we're hitting the limit of everything, but uh, here, here we have a fuel cell, and we have a fuel cell on the other side. And up here, we've got a tank full of life support as well as hydrogen and oxygen. We also have additional hydrogen and oxygen in the service module and inside the capsule itself. We, of course, have the the Atlas, was it the Atlas? No, no, uh, Able, the Able Core, right? Able Avionics package on the top there. If for the actual crewed mission, we would move this module down, and uh, so we won't have it quite so tall. So, anyway, here is the tank for the service module, and there's additional food, water, and oxygen on the service module. We still got the uh, solar panels there. I've moved the RCS ports a little bit so that they don't uh, blow at the solar panels. And of course we have this new little engine, the Asterisk engine, which seems to be a good idea. Okay, well now we've unlocked hydrogen and oxygen stages, we can of course use the great RL-10. And so the next stage is an RL-10, it is a configured to uh, RL-10A31. So a little bit more expensive, 433 vacuum ISP, 66 kilonewtons of thrust. And you can see it's got a 12 minute and 45 second stage there. And so that's the, that's, that up there is basically our, lun, um, sorry, uh, Earth orbit payload. That was the intention anyway, but it turns out that we still need to use the third stage to get to orbit, to complete our orbit, just like we did previously. So if I reduced the third stage down to just the lunar transfer amount, I still couldn't build a rocket underneath that uh, would get that to orbit, which was a pain, which, which was a serious pain. And I suspect it either has to do with the procedural inner stages, or it has to do with the weight of the guidance units, or it has to do with the weight of the tank because uh, by now I should be able to build a pretty darn good Saturn 1 right and I've used a J2 here but technically the Saturn 1 would have six uh, RL 10s and then at the bottom would have eight H1s and here these are configured to H1 and if we show a GUI here come on uh, it is current config H1 Saturn 1 so that's nice and the Saturn 1 was able to loft 20 tons to orbit this cannot maybe the Saturn 1B was the one that could loft 20 tons to orbit but look I've got nine of the H1s down there instead of eight and now I've got four H1 boosters as well so that's a total of 13 H1s and instead of having six RL10s I've got one J2 so more thrust and more overall Delta V in the stage well at least uh, more within the time. I didn't want to have a really long burn. And yet, with all of that power, I st and really about 200 tons heavier than a Saturn 1, I still couldn't loft 20 tons to orbit. So something's wrong here. <laughs> the something is very wrong here. Saturn 1 was supposed to be able to send 4 tons to the moon. I've got 3.9 tons here, and I can't, uh, I can't push it off to the moon. It's it's annoying. So, but anyway, uh, here we are. It's a heavier rocket than before, even though I'm using cryogenic fuels. And that's 
partly because I'm using I've got the fuel cells as well as the solar panels maybe maybe the extra heat shield I don't know up uh, another thing is that it's not properly reading the booster stage you can see it's sort of smushed the booster stage and the core stage in together instead of reading them separately I know that the boosters have about a minute and 40 seconds so they do stage off before the core is finished I don't know what the real max thrust weight ratio is because it doesn't seem to be separating them out well I think that just about says it all so instead of Saturn 1 of course I've named it Pluto 1 good enough name I think but it's sort of disappointing I was hoping I wasn't trying to recreate the Saturn 1 but I was hoping for something you know compatible something that wouldn't be so grossly heavier while sending over a payload that was equivalent anyway we'll see how this goes we're testing out without a Kerbal and everything seems to be packaged up just fine those are the boosters yep yeah. Uh, well, there's a little bit of a iffiness here. Okay, so let me get the launch escape tower. Well, that looks a little bit better, right? Uh, now the launch escape tower is going after the J2 lights, right? And so we've got 12,800 meters per second according to that. So, okay. Really tight though, still. We'll try it out and we'll see what happens. So, I'm going to save this as is and build one. This is really the main thing for today. Oh wait. Did not pass the editor checks. Mass limit exceeded, size limit exceeded. Aha. Uh -huh. Taller and fatter. Well, we'll try and fit it in. Now, uh, you'll note something. Because I was trying to match the Saturn 1 initially, or at least get something close to it so I've upped the utilization 90% here and here I decided not to do that with the core stage because uh, I'm trying to keep it keep it reasonable here the base stages usually have 86% or less I think okay now how is it still 50 tons heavier and 4.5 meters okay well I guess I'll have to unlock the... I could... I don't know what else to do. Yeah, I guess I'll have to unlock the launch pad upgrade. Okay, let's see. Yeah, it's a million for the upgrade. Well, we'll have to do it at some point. I guess now's as good a time as any time. But that means we'll have to wait, huh? Because now it's requested and it's got to take how long? Three years? It's got to take three years. Well, I guess I'm gonna have to re rebuild that rocket and fit within the current restrictions. Okay, um, hold on. We seem to have a lot of science, don't we? We've only got miniaturization going on here. Let's take a look at the tech tree first and then I'll, I'll work on that rocket and try and fit it in. Miniaturization is here. So let me reminded that it is already researching that and it doesn't look like we can research anything here yet because this requires other stuff it says requires electrics but oh that's because I can't research anything over a hundred science mature three axis control well that sounds important better plane stuff well I'm not really doing plane stuff improved staged combustion Ah, well, that so we we can build a N one rocket already. Actually, well, I mean, except for the size limit, yeah. So they're telling me I can build an N one. That that could be handy. I was trying to right now. My most powerful uh, kerosene engines are basically the H one or or uh, the the Soyuz engines. The RD-107 was it? And the RD-107s are really big, physically big, so you can't cluster them as much. These would be more powerful. Nice ISP too. Okay, um, yeah, let's research that. That makes me happy. So, I guess flight control. 
and hopefully with these advanced flight control things we'll get not only better cores but also better fuels so not the uh, hydrazine maybe MH and N204 which I'm in dire need of what do we need for capsules I mean it seems like oh it is probably the technology has unresearched requirements basic capsules we've got improved instrumentation where's improved it's the light bulb we have in we have both we have basic capsules and improved instrumentation and there's no other arrow going into it so what unresearched requirements gosh darn it well those heat shields are useless not rated for lunar returns well you can keep it then uh, but it'd be nice to get to mature capsules eventually actually not oh well, this is mark 2 pod here hmm okay well I don't know why that can't unlock let's take a look at what it would take to upgrade the research building because we'll eventually want to unlock some of these heftier ones seems like it's 400,000 so I will I will go for that we might as well queue it up okay so they're working on that as well and I'll take a year and a half almost okay let me work on my rocket okay well here we go I've got it to within 700 tons and uh, 60 meter height and I did that by widening it a little bit to 5.2 meters and well reducing the size of the core stage which uh, well increased our thrust to weight ratio but knocked off quite a bit of, bit of delta V about 180 meters per second altogether I sh yeah well we'll I don't know if this will get to the moon or not but we'll certainly be able to test the heat shield so that's a positive so we can't really waste time I don't think it's got to take I don't know why it's got to take 172 days maybe the cryogenic engines but let's get building the problem is we don't have much time until the contract expires um, crude lunar flyby 447 days so we have just enough time to build one of these and then build the next one don't know why it's so much heavier for so little bang for a buck maybe uh, do the fuel cells and the hydrogen and oxygen for them really take up that much hmm. might have to reconsider that since I'm already carrying the solar panels then again I was able to take off the two solar panels on the pot itself which is nice because they were ugly okay save and build oh wait a sec uh, it seems like the other one was placed on build list even though it couldn't fit on the launch pad is that a thing I should probably let me let me just scrap that one it's getting in the way of the the one that actually will fit but that one the the one that was not fitting on the launch pad seemed to take much less time why all I did was make the tanks smaller that's literally it I didn't change anything else I just made some of the tanks smaller and now this is taking 172 days whereas the other one was gonna take 112 let me increase my build time I have uh, because I unlocked those two technologies some extra build points does that reset anything well, that makes it a little bit nicer but that's ridiculous it's a smaller rocket. The other one was scrapped anyway. There wasn't anything. I mean, even if there were spare parts, the only thing was the tanks, and the tanks weren't identical. I don't get it. Hold that thought. I just remembered that we have this little all probe still hanging out, waiting to return. Ah, yes. This. And. It's been around here for a lot longer than I think it should have been. 53 days? I haven't time warped to the... Oh, wait. This this Pluto... Hold on. I quit out and uh, came back in. 
It looks like this is still here. Maybe... No, that's just not good. Why is it... Why does this one take more? It drives me nuts. Okay, I'm still going to uh, decide to scrap that one. Yeah. And maybe could you use that scrap to build this one? Maybe? Uh, anyway. Uh, so yeah, we still haven't time warped through to completing the Pluto 1 that can launch on the launch pad. Uh, did it take our launch pad? Yeah, our launch pad upgrades are in the works. Okay, so that's the situation. Uh, did it take... I don't think we got our upgrade points done though. Yeah. So we still got two upgrade points that haven't been spent. Okay, so that is the situation. I quit it out in order to uh, alleviate the RAM situation and then when I came back in things were not the same which is probably for the best since I had totally forgotten about this little guy. So this is a very important test of this heat shield obviously. It's worked so far, right? It didn't immediately blow up like uh, the capsule did. Parachutes are still primed. Electric charge is diminishing pretty darn quickly. That's the atmosphere. Uh, let me deactivate the main dish. Yeah, let me deactivate the main dish. Hopefully we'll come down this time. Maybe not. It's looking good with the periapsis going down, but... We'll see. Okay, here we go. Suborbital. This always takes a lot of time. But we're getting there. It's looking good. Plenty of ablator left. The little uh, heat indicator does not seem too bad off. This is really the thick of it. Smart ASS is using hydrazine, but it's nowhere near maxed out. And looks like we'll peak at a little bit over 7 G's. Alright, there we go. We are through. And I'm gonna temporarily reduce time warp. And we still have communication. Not for very long though, just a minute and 44 seconds left. Hopefully that'll be enough time. I don't think I need Smart ESS to continue controlling it like that. 20 seconds of power left. Two shoots are out. These are presumably the drogue shoots. Yep. We now have no power. Let's see if parachutes deploy without power. Interesting question. We also have no connection. Drogue shoots have already slowed us down quite a lot, and it's got to take a while to get to the ground. Not really helping with orientation because they're sort of close to the center of mass. Okay, we've got uh, parachute deployment of the drogue shoots, full parachute deployment. Still waiting for the main shoots, but we're already at 11 meters per second, so it should be fine. Oh wow, I put too many parachutes on this thing. We're at 1.6 meters per second. It's gonna take forever to get to the surface at this rate. Maybe I should cut some shoots, but I can't. I've got no connection. Okay, it is in the water. It's gonna have trouble stabilizing, maybe? Alright. We are recovering vessel. Let's see what we got out of it. Okay, uh, wow. 32,000 data gathered from the film return camera translated into 48 science. So we're doing it on the 32,000 data gathered, isn't it? Data value had to have been very, very fractional indeed. Biological sample got us 14.6. Recovery of the vessel got us 20. 82.6 science. 
and we recovered the parts as well, 76.2% of the total value. Pretty good. Uh, we didn't actually fulfill a contract like that, unfortunately, but uh, because that contract turned into science day from space around Saturn for some reason. But yeah, so let us see about upgrades. Yeah. And maybe I'll rush this one too. Okay, launch. Yeah, removing Jeb and launch. Okay, time warping to the right longitude of ascending node. By the way, one thing I forgot to mention earlier was that even though we unlocked cryogenic engines, we did not seem to unlock cryogenic tanks. We only unlocked service module tanks, which are of course heavier. That uh, possibly hampered my ability to recreate the Saturn I and necessitated our heavy rocket here. For some reason, there's a box here. I don't know why there's a box there. Two bars down here. Hmm, that was a sudden g-force buffeting. But we seem to be all right. We are... Uh, we're all filled up, I think. Uh, there's some diminishment of liquid oxygen there. Let's get going before that gets serious, shall we? Okay, throttle up, SAS on. Beats me why it's uh, going away that quickly. But, yeah, let's go. Ignition. And launch. I mean, I'm puzzled why it's going away that quickly, because it wasn't during the time warp. Okay, off we go. This has some serious thrust weight ratio initially, so we can start turning soon. Like, probably now. I do have the center engine on the on the first stage toggleable on action group nine, just in case I think that the thrust weight ratio is getting a little bit too high. Well, I can move the blue thing, whatever it is. Is that like test flight or something? I remember test flight having a box like that. I think we're gonna get to a high thrust weight ratio before the boosters actually stage off. I guess if that happens I'll shut down the center engine anyway. Even though it's not really a great thing to have to shut that off before staging the boosters. Oh that's four G's. I'll set I'll shut down the center engine. It's not gonna do too much though. Well, that's max acceleration. That's not our actual acceleration there. For some reason, it doesn't show current acceleration. We did uh, knock it below 4 G's. But it's creeping back up there again. Funny, the this G force indicator is already re reading like 5 G's, but we're not there yet. Oh, what happened? There couldn't have been that big an imbalance in the boosters, right? I checked the fuel this time. Oh, it must have been the boil off. Okay, booster set. I still have default tanks on those. I would like the cryogenic tanks. I'm not going to make those service module tanks for them sakes. And there's got a huge imbalance here too. Maybe I should switch it to, uh, to service module tanks. Okay, set. Ignition. Alright, J2 is successfully ignited for the first time in the series. Very good. I've ignited many J2s before, but this is the first time for this one. Okay, let's stage off the escape tower, make sure that that's right. Okay. Off. Excellent. That is off. We're above a hundred kilometers already. Things are looking good. Things are looking good. 
I still wonder about that box. Oh, here's test flight. Um, flight hut? Yeah, that that's what that was. Oh, uh, it looks like maybe it's in charge of the Arlton A3-1. If so, uh, we got to be in big trouble. We haven't done any testing on that yet. But it says 54.82 minutes mean time before failure. So that's good, right? So that's why that suddenly decided to pop up. Okay, I guess we'll keep it up. I swear that uh, that new heat shield must be adding a lot of mass, or maybe the fuel cells, because we're just, uh, well, we're going to need another thousand meters per second from the third stage, and that's not very good. Same sort of situation we've been in before. Okay, set. Okay, ignition. Okay, it works. And hopefully, uh, test light will keep it working. Okay, we've got some new messages here. What happened? Well, that stage was destroyed. That's the launch escape system was destroyed. The core tank was destroyed, obviously. We didn't have parachutes. But we did have parachutes on the boosters, so we did recover those. That's good, at least. If I could manage it, I'd put parachutes on the core and try and recover that as well. Alright, here we go, getting ready for orbit. We have enough fuel to get to the moon, so that's good, but not as much fuel as I would like. I wasn't paying attention to my inclination very closely. Lamenting over other numbers. Okay, let's shut it off there. 333 by 220? We do have enough for a lunar transfer on this stage, so that's pretty good actually. Still 16 tons to orbit, a little bit underwhelming for so many engines. 13 H1s instead of 8. Okay, so this is sort of a sloppy lunar flyby, but it does keep our periapsis down on the Earth side. And I want to focus on that this time. Make sure that we test what we came here to test. People keep saying I'm going too high, so I will try and bring it down sharply. Let's say 65 kil uh, kil 65 kilometers. I know some people go lower than that, but I'll, I'll keep it at 65. The moon periapsis is 26,000 kilometers, so not close at all. But uh, we didn't time it right, and we have this inclination issue. We could correct that. I mean, this only takes 3,122 and we have the free return back. We have like 500 meters per second extra. But again, I'm gonna just focus on what I'm supposed to test. And we won't uh, use any of the fuel to slow down on the Earth side. We will, we will see the full brunt of it, assuming that we couldn't do that. All right. All right, so let's deploy some solar panels. Let's see about the RL-10. It says very stable. That's good news. But will test flight finally decide to do its thing and nip our hopes in the bud? I don't know. Well, we've got some data units. Hopefully that'll help. Okay, I think we're close enough to ignite. And we have ignition. Very good. And let's SAS this. Alright. I will get back to you when the burn is close to completion, or when we are about to stage to complete the burn with the asterisk. Oh my, oh my, oh my. Uh, sorry, I wasn't recording during the long transit, and the RL-10 just exploded. The RL-10 just exploded. Uh, well, it says okay, but I think it's wrong about that. We just lost the RL-10. Um, F3. Um, explosion. Exclamation mark. 
Okay, maybe it might not be safe to use the RL-10 with a crude mission, huh? Hmm... Especially since test light seems completely clueless. Okay, right. Well, I guess we sep and continue. Uh, we technically have enough Delta V, so separation. And... And I are out. Okay. Well, uh, throttle up. And checking the asterisk. Very stable. Ignition. Well, off we go. Let me verify fuel cell functioning. Okay. Looks like the fuel cell is working. Not too much hydrogen and oxygen consumption, but there is actually water input. There's a negative number there. So that seems to be right. But I don't see it producing much. Well, yeah, I don't know. Well, this says negative 0.7, and the solar panels are only making 0.45, because we should be draining 0.28 and we're getting 0.71 so it's generating one unit per second or so okay I think we can accept that but uh, we can turn it off for now but the question is do we really need it I don't know only for the last bit when we dump the service module but possibly, you know, um, the life support does take some electric charge. When the Kerbal is in, we're going to have more drain than this. Okay, let me shut this off and use the RCS to do the rest. Okay, whoop, that's a little bit too far. Well, we can't fine tune it that much. It's either 55 or 87, so we'll have to fine-tune it later. Let's keep it to 87 for now. Okay, so without further ado, let's proceed. Uh, I don't think there's any point taking SAS off just to have it spin around a whole lot. I'm not requiring any particular orientation right now, and uh, if I want uh, the fuel cell is still running, is it, or not? Oh, we've got some overheating. The pot is still overheating, guys. I mean, you go, okay, well, we, we it wasn't bad off before. Now it's overheating. Is it the sun? I have gotten no confirmation that the sun is the cause of overheating. Let's try it. Uh, may maybe uh, if we turn it around, let's see if it cools off. Um... Maybe they have done that thing. So is this deactivated? Yeah, it looks like the only electric charge we're getting is from the solar panels. All right. Okay, so let's flip around. Okay, so now our tail is to the sun. Yep. Now let SAS fire the thrusters as much as it likes in order to stabilize. but let's get going anyway. Okay, so it's the sun. You know, does that mean that I should try and land on the nighttime side? And it's only the capsule that gets overheated with the sun. Everything else doesn't. The engine doesn't. The top of it doesn't. Parachutes don't. The probe didn't. The probe had nothing, nothing overheating with respect to the sun. But the capsule gets hot with respect to the sun. So weird. Well, now we know. The pod is still cool. As long as it's not facing the sun. Fascinating. Does that mean a hydrogen boil off will be more when the tank is facing the sun? I can't tell. I've got icons in the way there. Um, doesn't seem like we have boil off at all right now. We'd have to probably time warp through quite a long time before we see that. Hmm. Okay, we are passing by the moon, so let's do so. This is not the important thing. We're not trying to do any science here. 
Okay, we are out and we have a negative periapsis. That is not good. So, are we still oriented properly with the sun? Okay, I'll leave it like that and I'll just use RCS to adjust this. Well, I guess we probably should do some static fire tests of the RL-10. It's too important an engine to to uh, neglect it. Funny that it's one of the few that test flight bothers to pay attention to. Okay, well this is not working right at all. Let me turn that off. Let me try and control it myself. Now I just noticed something. You'll see that the hydrogen here has hardly been used. But even though I turn off the battery, the hydrogen up there is totally gone. Is that boil off? It was actually pointing opposite the sun though. So that's sort of surprising. Okay, I'm just gonna dump the service module here. There we go. We're ready to go. 64 kilometers-ish. So yeah, I should have dumped it normal, but... Controls were not going where I want them, wanted them to, to go. This is admittedly a harsh re-entry. But, as you would expect from coming back from the moon, and we've already seen a milder one in in the form of the all-probe returning. Okay, we have passed periapsis. Still got a lot of speed to burn off. We'll see if it works out for us. Ablator is really not ablating very much. I could dump some of that and maybe that'll alleviate some of the the tightness in our Delta V, though uh, part of the tightness in our Delta V was because the RL-10 blew up. I don't know, I think this is going to end up going around again, and I hope we'll have communication to correct it at uh, Apoapsis if it does, because 61 kilometers seems a bit harsh. 60 now. Yeah, we are going up again. So we we better get connection back or we're in trouble actually technically even if we didn't get connection back I could probably still control it thanks to Smart ESS and the fact that no connection doesn't seem to affect the RCS it affects whether I can turn on the RCS but not whether I can fire the RCS so yeah but I would like connection and we just got it back I wanted ap apoapsis, apoapsis though because we are trying to raise our periapsis Strictly speaking, I don't know if we really need the the fuel cells. It'd be nice and all, but we still seem to have a lot of power. Well, let's not risk getting out of communication range. I'll raise periapsis from here. I'll let uh, Smart ASS do what it's already programmed to do. Back to 65 kilometers. Clearly this could survive something less, but let's not overdo it well uh, well it won't be really a test of the lunar re-entry overdoing it right now I know this would be a good time to overdo it because well we don't have a Kerbal on board but this isn't the lunar trajectory anymore we are now firmly suborbital g-forces creeping up plenty of ablator we really need to dump that We'll probably use like 40 or something. I'm sure 100 will be more than enough. Keep in mind that we already had 200 gone from the pod itself, so we, we were only carrying 200. Does this pod have descent mode? It does, but I've never never really reconciled myself with descent mode anyway, so... I haven't really figured it out. I mean, I know what it's supposed to do, it's just it never seems to do that. Or sometimes it overdoes it. it never seems to do it just right. Looks like 7 G's. Mmm, possibly 8 G's. Okay, diminishing now. 
Let's check F3. Eight Gs. Not good. But uh, for a little pod like this, I guess we'll have to accept it. Whoa, those parachutes came out way early. <gasps> no, they were misconfigured. Well, I know what's next on my to-do list. Why would... I usually am very good about configuring the parachutes. I guess we've never get, gotten to this point with this pod before, have we? Hmm. Okay, well, uh... It's gonna be a pretty quick trip to the ground, isn't it? Okay, so... Well, basically, our... Our... Space Agency nightmare is over. We have managed to get a pod through the re-entry heating. The parachutes, obviously, I'll have to work on, but that's simple enough. Alright, so, yeah, maybe next time we'll launch a Kerbal on a lunar flyby. I guess that's the plan, though. Maybe the first thing we'll need to do is test some RL-10s to boost the reliability of them. Yeah, hopefully I'll remember that. Alright, so on that note, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.